have with me Michelle Bowen, who I will hand over to now. Hi, thank you so much, Alwyn. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. It's great to have you here, um, which will, uh, for I know, will be a very informative and interesting conversation. Uh, I'm Michelle Bowen. I'm the director of UK New Artists. I'm a white woman. I have short brown hair. I'm wearing glasses, a black top and a necklace. And I am sat in front of a painting um, and, and, and weirdly a jumper, but uh, there. So... Um, that is my good self. I will be listening very carefully to what Habib will be saying and maybe picking up some threads to kind of uh, pull on and draw on um, to kind of aid the conversation and uh, forward on any kind of useful information for, for new artists. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Habib. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Michelle and Owen. Um, yeah, I'll just describe myself quickly. I'm a black or brown man with uh, sort of dreadlocks tied in a little bun in a green and black top. And behind me, I've got the big check that I won for Robert Walters, UK New Artist of the Year. Um, in my studio, I've got some artwork behind me and sort of messy bits. <laughs> yeah, so, oh. yeah. Perfect, thank you, Habib. Um, so I'll just say welcome to the UK New Artist conversation with Habib Hajali. Um, he is the 2002 winner of the Robert Walters Group and the UK New Artist Year of the Ward and reciprocant of the Samuel Ross Black British Artist Grant. Habib is a talented artist whose work is recognized nationally. And during this online talk, Habib will talk about his creative practice, his work with UK New Artists and winning the Robert Walters Group UK New Artist Year of the Award. Um, he's also going to be sharing some top tips for his for new and emerging artists as well, which is really exciting. Um, we're so happy to be part of sharing Habib's practice with you today and to hear more about his work and his journey um, that he is on. So I'll pass over to Habib to tell us more um yeah so please take it away Habib. Thank you Olin. So yeah I'm Habib Pajali. I'm 27 years old originally from Bermondsey and I currently live in Dartford, Kent. Uh, last year I was elected as a member of the Royal Society of British Artists and I'm really happy to be able to do this talk today and sort of give some practical real life uh tips and just talk about uh, my progression thus far. Um, yeah, so I'll just get straight into it. I, um, I applied for my first open call uh, when I was 19 years old, when I was still in my first year of university. And sort of since then, I've been exhibiting and applying for open calls consistently. Uh, just, yeah, with the, with the view of ultimately becoming a full-time artist, uh, which I've been able to do for the past three to four years. So I went to Loughborough University, uh, studied fine art, and I graduated in 2017. I actually went there to sort of pursue rugby and art simultaneously, but uh, <laughs> got injured within the first few weeks of uni and never played rugby again, but that was sort of truly a <laughs> blessing in disguise and helped me to focus more on my art practice. Um, I just want to touch on the, sort of the the sort of use of having a fine art degree and my experience of the value of that in uh being a full-time artist like for me i i graduated with a two two and i know this is uh something that sort of if there's any students listening that they think is that they may think is quite important but for me i've not found it to be be that way um i think it's a valuable your, your studies are a valuable opportunity to have a free studio space essentially and sort of experiment and push yourself to make different kinds of work and find what works well for you. But I did find that uh, my time at uni helped me to uh, sort of like with, with the essay writing and writing a dissertation, it sort of helped me to be able to communicate my ideas more succinctly and sort of uh, articulate thoughts better. So for me, that was the main benefit of the degree as opposed to the um, piece of paper itself. Um, I found that 
in the first few years when I started to exhibit and apply to open calls, uh, there was a lot of uh, disillusionment for me, which would be for, um, so whenever I'd have sort of a micro success, as I call it, you know, getting into a show or being shortlisted for a prize, um, the, there's sort of an excitement around it and this idea of uh, sort of this exposure, which is an overused term, I think, in uh, sort of the emerging art world. Um, so I want to sort of try to demystify that and, and sort of explain some sort of practical ways of how I managed to navigate my career so far. Um, I think that <laughs> it's, it's important to, as a young artist or a new artist, to not take the rejection so personally, although it can be difficult. Um, I think the biggest piece of advice I'd give uh, initially would be to maintain your self-belief and sort of uh, be steadfast in things you believe in. Um, especially for me, my, my work at uni wasn't, um, I would get sort of lower grades for my practical work and sort of higher grades for my written work. And um, the sort of core ethos of my practice now started from work I was making in my late teens. So I think sort of um, taking advice with a, with a grain of salt is, is was important for me as well. Um, yeah, I graduated in 2017 and sort of continued to exhibit across the UK. And I was working part time in promotions as well uh, for a year or year or two after I graduated. Uh, I worked in promotions because I thought it was very flexible work. You could sort of choose your hours. The pay wasn't wasn't bad for for the work that it was, and it was sort of promoting brands or handing out leaflets. And, and things like that. It sort of allowed me to balance my time between sort of making a living and um, crediting artwork and having an art practice itself. Um, yeah, around around 20, sort of 2018 or so, I was sort of getting frustrated with uh, constantly being broke and not sort of excelling with my, my career as much as I hoped I would after university. So I remember uh, looking online on arts jobs for art related work and I came across a posting for Bloomberg New Contemporaries and I didn't have the relevant experience but I thought I'd apply for the open call itself to be a part of Bloomberg New Contemporaries 2018 and uh, fortunately I, I, I got through and uh, through the two rounds and the previous year I was rejected so it just shows you, you got to sort of back to the point that I was making not to take that rejection personally because judges change all the time and um, had I not applied it would um, I wouldn't have received uh, been able to go through many opportunities and doors that were open to me uh, to this day from an opportunity I went for what four and a half five years ago uh, such as uh, being contacted by a curator in 2020 for a commission at the Facebook uh, headquarters and that curator saw my work in 2018 at um, the Bloomberg New Contemporary Show. Um, around this sort of time in 2018, I also received my first sort of private commission. And that led to a period of like six to eight months of making a living solely from commissioned artwork. And sort of, I had one commission after another and that sort of kept me afloat for a while. Like I, I was still sort of <laughs> struggling to make ends meet, but I was a, a lot more fulfilled. And it was, uh, better for me uh, mentally than working part time in promotions. Um, working on those commissions that really helped my sort of uh, technical mark making ability because I found that making work for other people uh, made me sort of focus more and sort of technically more aware of how to produce like nuanced mark making, focusing on bolder tones and contrast and mid tone, which is crucial for me working in ballpoint pen. Um, it was just like a really great confidence boost because it was the first time I was sort of um, making money from, from art, although it wasn't my practice as such, it was my practice applied to sort of client needs. Um, but it just, it made me, it was a quite important turning point for me because it made me focus, it made me realize that I needed time and space to apply the sort of new skills I'd learned to my own practice and sort of implement implement that into a new body of work that would sort of uh, push me further than than the sort of level I'd been at before. And um, 
at the end of 2018, I got accepted to my first residency, uh, which would which was a four month residency in New Jersey in the US with a big pseudo space. Um, and it was just at, at the opportune moment for me because I needed that kind of space, as I said, and this was the first time in my career that I had that to sort of just focus solely on making work without worrying about sort of making a, a living from working or on other things. Um, but once I was accepted for the residency, I had to apply for funding because I would not have been able to afford, even afford the flights. So there was a stipend paid, I think it was $400 a month, which uh, you can't live on, as I'm sure is obvious. Um, so yeah, I was, around this time I was 23 years old and I was working in a, a studio for the first time after uni with artists from different backgrounds with more experience and just sort of working in that kind of way, working with people with different perspectives, but also with the same ambition was invaluable for me. And, you know, when, when I came back to the UK, I thought, oh, I've got this great new body of work and everything's just going to take off. But <laughs> the months that followed my return to the UK presented my longest ever string of rejection emails that I've ever received. Um, so I had fewer exhibitions that year and I was up for less art prizes than any other year. And that sort of made me um, question of, uh, how viable uh, an art career would be for me. And that was as close as I've ever got to quitting. Um, but I think it's important to uh, sort of ground yourself and think pragmatically about it um, in that kind of way. And that's what I did. I, I was so focused on, on being an artist and sort of all consumed by it that I think it was sort of detrimental to my work and also my mental health at the time. And I think that's an important thing to sort of bear in mind as you start your career. And in these early stages, it's so precarious that things change all the time as well. On the, on the flip side of the rejection emails, you, you never know how close you are to sort of getting that one success that will turn things around. <clears throat> but yeah, um, I think that sort of balance between uh, being driven to sort of become a full-time artist and balancing your work, your, your life and sort of everyday commitments is something that is important to think about and sort of looking at at things object objectively and trying to find a balance is is imperative, I think. Um, so yeah, uh, around 2019, I was sort of at this uh, crossroads where I had to choose between sort of packing it in and maybe finding a quote unquote real job or uh, sort of giving it one last big push and I decided to apply for Arts Council funding again and I was fortunate enough to get accepted for a national uh, lottery project grant which changed everything once again for me. Um, this was at the end of 2019 so I uh, with the project grant I was able to budget for an amount of money to actually pay myself for the new work that I'd be creating. So um, I think the Arts Council is amazing for, for artists who have ideas and, and need, need uh, time and space to make new work and sort of develop your, your practice. And I think it's a resource that's really um, not spoken about enough with regards to emerging art, art world circles. Um, yeah, so 2019, I got fun, uh, first my first national lottery project grant. And this coincided with the biggest sale of my career up to that point in, in uh, December of 2019 with the ING Discerning I exhibition. And I sort of gained momentum from there. And then in early 20, 2020, just before uh, the lockdown, I won the signature art prize for drawing and printmaking. And uh, perhaps more significantly, uh, I then recorded my next biggest sale which was tripled the previous amount. And around this time, I was still sort of, I was sort of gaining momentum and sort of confidence in the viability of my work and, and thus um, build, building an art practice. And since then, I've had three further projects funded by the Arts Council, uh, been an artist in residence four times, which for me has 
massively helped to push the scope of my practice to what I thought was previously possible. And uh, yeah, that's just a sort of run through of my journey to this point. Um, can we get the next slide, please? But, uh, Oh, sorry, yeah, the one after that. Thank you. Yeah, so um, just a bit about my practice. Um, my practice looks to sort of champion figures from ethnically diverse backgrounds that I, I believe have been conspicuously omitted from traditional British portraiture. Um, my ballpoint pen drawings uh, attempt to rectify the, the historic sort of lack of visibility of figures from such backgrounds. So um, conceptually within the work, I'm trying to question preconceived notions we may have uh, regarding what it means to be quintessentially British, as well as sort of the nuances and the uncomfortable conversations that go around this. This is sort of imperative for me, especially in the direction my work has taken more and more. Um, and yeah, as I said before, I was, born in Bermondsey and sort of live in Kent now, but my heritage is Sierra Leonean and Lebanese, and that has on occasion and seems to be a constant thread running through my practice, sort of being informed by, by, my, um, by my heritage, uh, specifically my West African culture at home. Um, I could speak Creole as a language we speak in Sierra Leone before I could speak English, even though I was born here. So it's a big part of me and thus a big part of my work, because my work's very sentimental, it's always very personal to me. Um, I use a lot of anecdotal references to sort of portray these imagined scenes. Um, and you, I use myself a lot, as you can see on the image on the left, um, with the moustache. This is sort of, this, sort of, this is to sort of bring the proximity of the work closer to the viewer and sort of play on things uh, to do with representation and empowerment, but using uh, at times using humor as, as a vehicle to do that. Um, I use a lot of antique texts and, and maps as canvases for the work, so you can see. Uh, this sort of recontextualization allows me to sort of find a cohesion between the forgotten sort of uh, used objects and the themes that inform the work as well. So there's sort of, I, I think there's like a nice marriage going on between the two and sort of each text feeds into the narrative of any specific artwork as well. So when you see the works in person, you should be able to sort of pick out some of the lines and it, it may help to um, sort of, it will sort of allow you to find where I'm coming from, which, which, which should hopefully uh, meet nicely with the uh, perception that the viewer may have. Um, so yeah, I specialize in black ballpoint pen because I, I find it an interesting point uh, and place to sort of paradoxically champion people of color in a monochrome medium. Uh, I do that because I think it shows that there's more to an individual than just the color of their skin. And um, using these delicate mark making techniques with uh, just an everyday and not just medium of ballpoint pen sort of allows me to champion an, al an analog um, process within an increasingly digital world. You know, um, I think sort of growing up, we, you know, you, you, you write a lot more than you did than, than we do now as a, as a society at whole. Um, so yeah, uh, ultimately the work uh, depicts motifs that I think challenge largely accepted revisionist narratives. Uh, specifically with West African histories um, and sort of challenging the antiquated ideologies that I think are at the root of what I call nuanced prejudice that I've experienced personally. And yeah, ultimately um, my work looks to catalyze the discourse and just embolden individuals that have been labeled as the other, whether that be based on race, uh, gender, sexuality, anything. It's sort of, it, I, I'm, sort of trying to break down those barriers of entry and sort of give a voice to people who have been, uh, who have sort of faded to obscurity a little bit. Um, to get the next slide, please. Yeah, I want to talk about sort of the, uh, 
practicalities and making a living as an artist, which is something that I learned nothing about um, at uni or sort of in the art. You know, it's, it's something that's not spoken about nearly enough, I don't think. Um, everyone knows it's not easy to make a living, a living as an artist. Um, I don't need to tell you that, but, but I want to talk about my experiences and how that can relate to you. Um, I've been a full-time artist since uh, 2019, and I, I think there are just so many resources we have in the UK that people should be more aware of. Um, so discovering the Art Council um, National Lottery Project Grants and their Developing Your Creative Practice Grants were a complete game changer for me. And as I said before, I first applied for funding in 2018, so I could go on my residency. But um, with the Developing Your Creative Practice Fund, you can apply for to literally pay yourself to either have time to research new ideas, make a new body of work, or as I did, to go on a residency that I otherwise would not have been able to sort of capitalize on. And the National Lottery Project Grants allow you to sort of engage with communities and if, if your work is sort of has a socio-political or even just a social aspect to it, it allows you to sort of expand upon ideas you may have and I think it's a really um, underappreciated resource we have with the Arts Council for, for young artists so um, I would make a note of, of those if you if you are not already aware. So the National Lottery Project Grants are have rolling deadline, don't have a deadline, it's an open deadline, so you can apply whenever. Uh, DYCP, I think they have several deadlines throughout the year. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, online galleries. Uh, I first signed up to Artfinder, Saatchi Art, Singular Art, and I think Degree Art, when I was in sort of 2016, 2017, and I didn't get any sales for two years, two and a half years maybe. But once I started to build momentum, I found that sales came through these websites because I was consistent and I continued to upload new work and sort of be and concisely write about the work as well. And as you exhibit more, as you're shortlisted for more prizes, you can update your CV on these platforms and they, um, they have curators that will make lists every month or on different things. So if you keep your online presence consistent on these online galleries, you give yourself a better chance of being seen by people that actually want to buy art, you know, and I just, I, I've also personally found that people will find me on one of these websites. Um, I think Rise Art, Search Art, and Art Finder are the best three for me, I've found. They may find me on there, and then they'll uh, join my mailing list on my website, or they may contact me directly through Instagram or something, and then buy work at a later date. And obviously that mitigates the, the sort of huge commissions sometimes that they have. Although Search Art and um, Art Finder uh, take less of a commission, which is obviously uh, really helpful for us. Um, and yeah, once you start building a collector base from there, I think um, it's a, if you, it costs a bit more to have a online store, but I definitely think it's worth it once you start seeing sales come in. Um, I use Wix because I like the sort of ease of uh, the layout on there. And uh, it's just very convenient and it's more affordable, I found, than other uh, website hosts. Uh, I think I pay around £200 a year and yeah it's just I think it's important just, I have sort of my original artwork on there prints and limited edition prints and I know that uh, the cost of making prints can be expensive but I've uh, a tip that I do and I use is um, I sort of do prints on request so instead of spending a fortune getting all the prints in at once I order them as the orders come in and I think that's a good way to do it, especially if um, you're trying to manage your, your money as well, which is crucial. Um, so yeah, most of my sales, my biggest sales, most of my sales come from my website, personally. 
um, and that's for sort of mid mid level mid price range originals and uh, a lot of print uh, sell quite a bit on there as well. But my biggest sales have all come through uh, physical exhibitions. In 2016, I sold my first original, and that was for 150 pounds. And uh, it's still the same feeling of being overjoyed and humbled that someone spends their hard-earned money on something that you've made, even even now that uh, I'm fortunate enough to uh, get sales in the sort of four-figure range, you know. Um, yeah, could get next slide, please. Um, yeah, winning the uh, Robert Walters UK and UI for the year 2022 was uh, definitely the biggest and most significant uh, moment of my career thus far. Uh, yeah, it sounds cliche, but winning, sort of just exhibiting at the Saatchi Gallery was a dream come true. It's, it's a gallery I visited since being a little boy, <laughs> really. And uh, I sold two works there. One of them was my biggest sale thus far, and that was just um, also just incredible. But opportunities like the UK New Arts of the Year are, are very special because for a £10,000 prize and a second place prize of £5,000 and not having to pay a entry fee um, is something that does not happen at all, I don't think. And I so keep up to date with opportunities, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. But uh, for me, it was, um, yeah, a sort of validation of all the years of sacrifice and sort of hard work. And also being an artist of a, you know, being a black British artist and a person of, of color to sort of be uh, winning awards that's for you, UK artists, you know, and sort of showing that art being made in the UK is changing and is progressive and sort of, um, yeah, just, just, yeah, just massive validation from such an esteemed panel of judges, really. And during the evening as well, um, you get to, and just speaking with, with all of the judges and, um, and their background, it's, it was really insightful and really uh sort of eye-opening and just i received some you know really pragmatic sort of realistic ad advice and, and and that kind of thing so it was a, a great opportunity that is still um quite surreal <laughs> for me to be honest so yeah can we have the next slide please thank you um let's talk about artist opportunities um I think there's a lot of uh, importance placed on social media and a lot of talk around it and a lot of pressure for artists. And I think, um, yeah, for me, um, using Instagram has allowed me to gain a few sales over the years, but not many. Um, I'm not the kind of person who would spend like a lot of time on social media anyway. I only use it for my work. Um, and I think that it's easy to fall into the trap of making content just for your social media profile as opposed to thinking about the utility of it. You know, some artist work does not translate well to social media and that's fine. Um, but if you can use it just as a means of sort of documenting your thoughts and your process and finding a use for it for yourself as well as for people who may be interested in your work, then that's great. But I think um, spending too much time worrying about the content you put out there and a highly curated Instagram feed um, is, cannot, is not always the most productive thing you can do with your time. I think there are many valuable resources that get neglected when you sort of overthink that. Um, resources that I'll uh, touch on now. Uh, these are some free online uh, resources that share opportunities for open calls with art prizes, um, residencies, funding, and yeah, everything to do with sort of artist opportunities. And um, my, advice, uh, my advice would be to carve out time for your admin, because that's the, um, the most important thing, really. You can make uh, the most uh, groundbreaking 
work ever. But if, if you, you're not getting it out there to people, then ultimately um, no one's going to come and find you. You have to seek out these opportunities. So every two weeks or so, I look on ArtQuest, ArtRabbit, MomaList UK, and Curator Space. And that's something I've done consistent, consistently since I've started. The list of websites I would use for opportunities has gone, as I've, as I've progressed through my career, I've sort of narrowed them down to these ones. And whenever I talk to <clears throat> sort of emerging artists or anything like that, I tell them to sort of go on these websites, just take a bit of time every two weeks. You'd have to do it all the time. Just keep a spreadsheet or just make a note of, of what's out there. And um, yeah, as I say, you know, the vast, vast majority of my exhibitions have come through open calls. And yeah, it just allows you to get your work out to uh, a variety of different audiences and you get to exhibit alongside artists with more experience than you have and you pick up these, you know, valuable nuggets of advice and it's just crucial in those early years. And um, lastly, I'll, I just want to say, uh, talk about the importance of networking. Um, I think it's something that is spoken about a lot, but and it can seem quite daunting at the beginning, but it's just talking to people. Uh, you know, um, talk to fellow artists or curators, curators or, or just guests at, at private views or just people in an exhibition you're in, or it may not even be an exhibition you're in, just go to private views, talk to people, and, you know, ask people about themselves. And it's also good practice for becoming comfortable with sort of talking about your own work. So it doesn't feel like um, so, you, so you can wax lyrical about, about your stuff and and build sort of organically and naturally build these connections that down the line may play an important role for you. And I, I found that as I progress, I've become more comfortable uh, with doing that because you sort of realize that everyone's sort of in a, in a similar position uh, as you and and a lot of the things that you're worried about are relatable to some people as well. And so building these connections are important, but yeah, don't don't overthink it. Enjoy enjoy these little moments and 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 sort and sort of enjoy the struggles as well and relish in those little successes and and use that to further galvanize you. Um you can get the last, I think it's the last slide next week. Yeah, just Sort of final tips, um, I'd say, um, make sure your online web, your, make sure you have a website firstly, um, make sure it flows well and keep it up to date with new works and up to date CV. Um, look at search engine optimization. On Wix, they have a really sort of uh, easy to digest sort of guide put in layman's terms that is easy to follow on and it makes a big difference. Um, start a mailing list if you don't already have one and keep it and um, regularly post if that's once a month, if that's every quarter, um, just share news of exhibitions you've got coming up, maybe new work, uh, new uh, prints you may have for sale and uh, uh, building that uh, sort of collector base or just even people with an interest in your work who may not be collectors yet, but they sort of champion you and champion your work is very important, especially as time goes on. Um, I've had people on my mailing list for years who never bought a thing and then um, you have a big exhibition and then they come along and, and they, they buy an original straight on the on the private view, you know, so the, you, you never know what's going to happen. Um, Sign up to the free online galleries that I mentioned earlier. And most crucially, be consistent. Um, be consistent with regularly applying and sourcing out the opportunities because uh, the admin, the importance of the admin can't be um, understated. Um, it's the only thing that's going to get your work out there, especially in the early stages. And I think it's important to remember that you define your own success. Um, it's easy to put a lot of pressure on yourself and find it overwhelming and, you know, success to you may mean uh, getting you working in, in one exhibition, it may mean winning an award, selling work, or becoming a full-time artist. Um, you know, I, I worked part-time for a couple of years after graduating to make enough money to survive while balancing, balancing my 
our practice and um yeah like in hindsight that sort of struggle was uh sort of getting me the mouse and sort of the, the grit to keep working hard and appreciate all the little successes uh, you know i know many full, many uh content and fulfilled people who have regular day jobs and they make art um on the side and they're perfectly happy with that uh you make your own rules and you know whatever you want to achieve uh should be should be up to you uh how you define that uh, but yeah i'd say be organized as well uh divide your time up between uninterrupted studio time uh even if that's for an hour in the evening or several hours on on a day off if you've got a day job if you've got family commitments but just finding something that works for you and being consistent with that you know half an hour every day in the evening is better than than an hour on a sunday you know uh, put time aside to also work on your online presence too. Uh, so yeah, as I said before, creating a website um, and sign up for um, so some reputable, reputable online galleries as well and keep them up to date. So Saatchi Art, Rise Art, Art Finder, as I said previously. And, you know, allow the inevitable setback to motivate you and galvanize your ambitions. I know that's easier said than done, but don't take the rejection to heart because it happens to all of us all the time. And it's part of the process. And it sort of, it can allow you to sort of hone in more on work and things that are more important to you. And you can take more risks that way as well. Um, yeah, also you, I, I want to stress this point, you as a person and your, and your work isn't valid, validated by the opinion of every single judge and every open call. Judges change all the time. And if you get rejected, you can apply again. With the UK New Artist of the Year, I, I applied two years before. The first time I wasn't even long-listed. Second time I was long-listed, but they make the short list. And I was fortunate enough to win uh, the last, last year's one. So it, it just shows you, you just gotta keep going. Um, yeah, as I said before, every week or two, Look on the website that I uh, spoke on earlier, Art Rabbit, Art Quest, Curator Space, Moment UK. Uh, also, you can check on zealous.co. Um, More Galleries website is another good one. Um, yeah, make work that you enjoy and that's uh, true to yourself. Uh, don't be afraid to show vulnerabilities and make work around issues that you care about. Uh, don't make work that you think other people will like if it's not true to your artistic vision, you know, um, the sales will come along with putting in the work and there's a right gallery out there and a right collector for every type of work. So just be consistent with that as well. Um, and just by staying in the game and not quitting and not giving up, you give yourself a chance. You know, a, a lot of micro successes lead to sort of macro change and yeah it's just that word again it's consistency it's crucial so yeah just regularly check out the open calls maintain the online presence and enjoy the process of making new work i would say um but yeah uh just finally most importantly i also think it's important to stress uh that it's important to look after your mental health as well because it can be isolating and stressful as an artist and it anxiety inducing how precarious uh, your career may be and um, yeah taking time aside when things are a bit too much can sometimes be the most productive thing you can do and that's it from me <laughs> thank you thank you so so much that was very insightful and I certainly found out a whole lot more about your work than um than than I did than I knew so that that's been amazing thank you um if I'll ask Madara to take the presentation off the screen if that's okay thank you very much um I will give the audience an opportunity if there are any questions we're very happy to put them in the chat um if you don't want to uh ask them yourself otherwise please unmute 
and ask or unmute and un, 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 un video so we can see who's out there and ask away, please. So are there any questions from um, our audience? OK, I have a couple of things which I was listening to and um, wanting to pick up on, which I kind of hear a lot about. And I'm going to start with a kind of classic, which is about applying for Arts Council funding. And many new artists, young artists get um, put off about how to do that, the expectations about what the Arts Council wants to hear. Um, and you know, approaching that really. Do you have any advice about, you know, uh, how you went about it? Because I think there's yeah. a lot of barriers and expectations, and oh, I'm not good enough, or they're going to expect this, particularly around community engagement, reaching the public, public yeah. benefit. You know. Oh yeah, that's that's a great uh, question, Michelle. Yeah, I should have elaborated on that a bit more. Yeah, so I went to a talk by Jeremy Della in 2017. And he said one thing that really stuck with me and he was talking about funding. And he was like, the thing he said was be concise. If there's a 3000 character limit, try and get your point across in 300 characters. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need to fill the word count. And um, one thing I've learned is your project doesn't need to like change the world. It can be something quite simple. Yeah. Simple. And yeah. like when I was, um, one time I was applying for funding and my project was really ambitious. I wanted to do all this stuff in, in the whole county of Kent. And um, <laughs> I, and then I, and then I sort of, I realized I, I went through the guidelines again and then I was really specific. I was like, it's just Dartford. Yeah. And then I got, and then, and then I got, Funding the time I played after after that because it was more specific and more mm. more focused. Um, mm. I think also assume they don't know you as well. Don't um, and something may seem obvious to you, but it may not be to the person reading your proposal. Um, yeah, I start with bullet points of the, of how what is the thing I'm trying to get across. Yeah. Like what? Why do I need the funding? Yeah. What's um, what's this project going to achieve for me and for the public? Like, I'm not a artist whose work is, you know, my work is very political, but it's not, um, <clears throat> it's not centered around this community engagement, which is such a big thing for them. Um, communicate, community engagement can literally be um, you wanting to get in a certain demographic of people yeah. to an exhibition you're hosting. Yeah. So exactly. I would say don't over overthink that bit because, yeah. you know, I always think about like who's my work meant for I just yeah. as I make as I'm making the work. Mm. So just allow yourself to sort of expand on the key mm. points within your practice, I would mm. say. And I think um, I totally yeah. agree with you. And I think it's always better to write from the heart and, and who you are, not what you expect them to hear. You know, Absolutely. sometimes it's like, right, you know, you're not writing to your bank manager. They need to know who they're investing in, what change will take place because of what they're doing. So be honest and be you, you know, not, yeah. you know, something else because you think that's what they want to hear. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and we there's do, a question. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a question from Holly in the chat. There's some lovely comments as well, I believe. So I would check those out in a little bit. I'm sure he will have a moment to read them in a second. Um, but Holly's question is that I was just I just wondered how you juggled part time work initially and being an artist. Did you have a studio at the time and what was the balance like? Because I know that you did speak a lot about this balance, which was one of the things I really loved um, about hearing you talk, actually, so honestly about the practicalities of being an artist and how so many artists have to balance um, a job that's going to pay the rent and also doing their practice. Um, so I think Holly was just wondering, I guess, some yeah. maybe some tips on how you how you practically manage that while you were doing it. OK, cool. Yeah. So uh, I would do something like three or four days a week because I I'm the type of per person who I can't sort of go to work and do a half day and then come back and and do my work. I know artists that can do that, but for me personally, it just didn't work. 
Um, so I, th I think it's about finding what works for you. And, and as I said, I think it's like, even if it's an hour in the evening or on those days off, you dedicate men many hours in those days off to it, but it's about being consistent with it. And sort of the way I looked at it, which I've just remembered, and I would just sort of say this all the time and it was really pretentious, but I think it holds weight. It's, you know, you, you value your time when it's uh, when you're being paid for it by someone else, but you should value your own time for yourself as well. Oh, that's lovely. You, you know, yeah. like don't, you, you turn up to work on time because you're being paid for it. Wow. You know, you turn up a bit early, if anything. So like turn up for yourself as well. Nice, that's lovely. Um, do we have any other questions? I just have a couple more things that I really picked up on as well. So I'll just give everybody a chance to not hear my droning voice. But um, so I think, you know, and I know a lot. I know this is coming up through the chat as well about that, that resilience and rejection. You know, we all have it, well, you know, without, without absolutely we're all not all we are all touched by that. But where do you kind of dig into that resilience and kind of managing that? And yeah, it's probably not an easy question to answer. Yeah. But I think it's something that affects everybody. And how do you not let it take over you? You know, um, um, I sort of I try and take a, a step back and like yeah. look at things, look at sort of the bigger picture. Like it's not the end of the world. And for me, even if even if um, I think it's just how I've always kind of been as as a person. I think um, it's easy to get wrapped into the idea of being an artist, this romantic idea. Of, oh, I'm going to lounge in the studio and have grapes and wine and paint on the easel. But <laughs> you need to, you know, it's it's not like that. You have to sort of take the good with the bad, and it's just like any any job. If you're ambitious enough, you give yourself a better chance. There's no guarantees of success. But I was always comfortable with the, with the fact that as long as I tried my best, and even if it yeah. didn't work out, at least I wouldn't have any regrets. Mm. And and that's uh, sort of being very candid uh, about that. And yeah. it's, it's it's just one of those things. And it's remembering that you know successful artists and people who are sort of making a living, they've been told no so many times. And it's just mm. about truly looking um, looking at the, you know, sometimes looking at the numbers helps as well. Mm. You know, if you think about it, like I, like I, we were speaking about earlier before the talk, I was, I was yeah. judging for a competition and we had four, over 4,000 entries. Crazy. and 200 spaces yeah and that's that's five percent you know we said we said no to way more great work than than yeah. not and on another day a lot of the works that didn't get in would have gotten in mm -hmm. you know and it, it's mm -hmm. literally as close as that but all mm -hmm. that artist is going to see on the screen is your work has not been accepted for this mm -hmm. uh, we can't mm -hmm. give any feedback mm -hmm. but you know you could there were so many people that were on just one vote away from being accepted. Mm. And it, it, yeah, no, I think it's you're, you know, you're absolutely right. And I think that's interesting. I mean, you know, there, there is, there is a sadly always going to be rejection. But I would say there's, you know, and, you know, if it's, there is a free opportunity, so let's take, for example, the Robert Walters, you know, yeah. You, 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 all, all you're spending is some time. It's a re reasonably easy yeah. process. You're not spending any money, but your work is going in front of you know a very strong panel and I think it's picking up on something you said earlier as well which is like that person saw my work in 2016 and then two years later they came back and then they asked you know so actually it's kind of um you know that um what am I trying to say you may you know that those people are seeing your work and you may never get your work in front of those people normally now it may not get to you know the end result but there, it's in their eyes. So if they like it, they might follow it up. They might start following you on Instagram. They might take yeah. heed of your name, you know, because they, you're, for, you know, oh, this is exciting. 
So, you know, the other judges may have different views and uh, collectively, you know, you may not get shortlisted, you may not end up winning, you know, there are lots of reasons, but nothing bad will coming from showing your work to in, in, to an audience, you know what I mean, to, to a yeah. panel of judges. Um, and, you know, um, Jacob, who was one of your fellow shortlisted artists, had also, you know, was I think his third time of applying, you know, and, you know, and it's having that persistence and that belief in yourself and that kind of, you know, if I'm doing the best I can do, I can put myself forward and, you know, ha and and it will sort of, you know, find its moment, I suppose, as, as, as a shorthand to it. Um, I see there's another question. There is another question in the chat, but I also just to say, Habib, I love the talk about um, resilience and just, I think you just have to do, like know that you're going to apply to way more stuff um, yeah. and just hope that some stuff comes back and, it, and it's sometimes a hard thing to take. Mm. Um, yeah. So please forgive me if I mispronounce this name, but Yi Sai Linny um, is asking, you mentioned that there are, um, that the art market is getting more diverse. Have you felt disadvantaged being a black artist? Um, how you say it? I, 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 I know this, this artist. Um, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I felt disadvantaged, but I haven't, I always notice those moments when you're the only person of color in a room. Uh, in an exhibition or when the curation sort of in a large group show may have all the artists of colour in one corner and the works have nothing to do with each other or it's just a sort of lazy sort of just showing to the side and I think it's um, I think when there are instances where I feel like um, race has been sort of a factor and I felt uncomfortable. I've been, I feel more comfortable now to bring it up in a sort of uh, calm sort of way. And I think that's, I think addressing those instances is how, is like one practical way that we can make changes. But you know, it's, I can easily see how some people may not feel comfortable doing that as well. And, and that shouldn't be the case. And that shouldn't come from us as artists. That should be change that occurs in uh, sort of a wider context. Uh, a lot of the time, like we sort of carry this this burden of like trying to make change and all this stuff. But it it it, it can feel like you're sort of screaming into an echo chamber. Like you, there is a lot of solidarity and there's a lot of change that is happening. Like for example, I'm working with uh, one of my residencies is with UAL's Decolonizing Arts Institute. And that looks at just that. It's working with 20 partner galleries and practical ways of sort of representation and making a change and uh, rectifying these histories that have uh, uh, sort of for too long uh, gone on being revised, you know? Mm. Yeah, and a lot of your practice is also about actively doing that as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, that you spoke about in the presentation. Mm. Sorry, Michelle. Yeah. No, no, I was just going to pick up because one of the other things I, I sort of, I, I, I sense through your journey is this kind of opportunity about residencies, you know, and kind of the role that they have played um, yeah. and, and, and what that, and how that gives a different aspect and viewpoint to your practice and time away and a different environment. I don't know if you want to speak to the yeah. usefulness of not applying for residencies. Um. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I work from home in this uh, little box room. I could probably <laughs> touch, touch the wall. Wow, well, um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I like that. I focus more when I'm by myself. It, I've got my draftsman table that sort of tilts up and I put music on and I listen to podcasts and I, and I in our work and yeah. I find I'm most productive when I'm completely by myself or if I'm with uh, other new ambitious hard-working people and those are the people that you meet when you're in residencies and you get to know people from completely different backgrounds uh, and you get to, to travel as well 
Mm. And if you get there, there's some great opportunities out there. I, I won a prize to go on a residency in Provence and in, in France last, last summer. I was there for three weeks and I was working every day for what 10 12 hours. Mm. And there was a, a couple that were artists from LA in the early 70s, you know. And some of these, we, we'd have these great chats all day and we'd make completely different kinds of work and we're still in touch now. And you make these connections that really sort of push you and you get other people's perspectives on your work and you learn about their work, which may be uh, stuff that you've never even considered. And you, it just, it's, it's just very eye-opening. And I think mm-hmm. it's been crucial for me in sort of uh, pushing the potential of my work further. And sure. it's something that I can, I can still see it, it's happening now and it's, um, mm-hmm. I think, I think, yeah, I can't recommend applying for residencies enough. And it, it sort of goes hand in hand with the Arts Council thing, because you've got to write a proposal that stands out and that is also concise. Yeah. So I think sort of if you can uh, work at both of those, like, kind of in tandem, then it, it can be helpful. It's a good combination. Yeah. Okay, well, on that very good and positive note, um, and I, I don't believe unless there's last chance, anybody for any more questions, um, I will thank you very, very, very much uh, for sharing who you are, your journey, and and, and some really great advice um, with, uh, with ourselves and everybody, and um, just thank you very much for your time, it's much appreciated. So to everybody in the audience, thank you for joining us. We're now going to stop the recording and um, draw this wonderful chat to a close.